Welcome to the Pharma Forum podcast. In this episode, I speak with Vino Malarapu, Vice President of Global Strategy and Operations at eClinical Solutions. Together, we discuss pretty much everything to do with successful implementation of artificial intelligence, or AI, and machine learning, or ML, within pharma and healthcare. Exploring the essentials and foundations and the need for adaptation, as well as high quality and right data, all things considered, we chat around the cruciality of keeping the human in the loop too. There's a futuristic aspect to our conversation, certainly but I hope it remains and concludes with feet firmly on the ground and its applicability in life sciences. Thank you for listening. This is web editor Nicole Raleigh, and today I have with me Vinu Malarapu, Vice President of Global Strategy and Operations at eClinical Solutions. Welcome, Vinu. Thanks. Today, we're going to be discussing everything or mostly everything to do with successful AI implementation within pharma and healthcare settings. While there has been rapid adoption of such technology due to the rise in AI promising to improve many facets of the healthcare industry, nonetheless, without the proper foundation in place, companies may not fully realise its true potential. Rather, as Vinu and I will discuss, the real power of AI is in the ability to harness data and extract insights for complex use cases. Indeed, I want to talk more about this. But first, Vinu, perhaps you could tell us more about you, about your journey to this position and company you work in today. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, uh, it's been a long one. <laughs> uh, but I, um, by education, I was an engineer, uh, did my bachelor's in electronics and communications and master's in software systems, uh, started my career as a developer uh, almost uh, 25, 26 years ago, and uh, moved up the ranks uh, to uh, tech lead, architect, uh, and then switched over to the management side of things uh, from project uh, program and delivery management. And along the way, played you know multiple roles, you know customer relationship, account management, sales, and so on and so forth. Before I joined eClinical Solutions, I was uh, leading a global consulting you know practice with a large system integrator, uh, and joined ECS as a VP for global strategy and operations. And as part of my role, I'm helping our teams drive uh, the strategy around product partnerships and professional services. And on the operations side, uh, responsible for all of our operations uh, in India, which is a big part of our you know, R&D and uh, subsequent uh, services to our uh, customers. I live in Raleigh, happens to be your last name as well, Nicole, <laughs> uh, in North Carolina, uh, in the East Coast of U.S. Thank you, Fino. Yes, I, I know Raleigh, actually. I have family out there. Um, but let's return to use cases then. What is the right use case? to start and the small steps that need to be taken before adopting AI at a larger scale? I mean, given your background, you must have a pretty full answer for us, Vino. <laughs> I'll try. Some of the things that I think we should start off with is, you know, what's essential to uh, AI ML? And uh, first and foremost, in my opinion, um, is domain knowledge. Uh, what that means is full understanding of the business process that is required to deliver the products or services uh, within a given industry. And the second thing um, is the data, right? You should have access to a lot of data that would be required to train the models, to validate the models uh, before you put them to good use. Uh, that is something that people do not realize or recognize um, to start with and will run into issues. And then the last one is, you know, having the right method for making the predictions because machine learning is essentially making predictions of something, you know, um, that uh, something in the future or, you know, a data point that uh, could occur and that may happen, so on and so forth. And have the time recognizing the right use case or identifying the right use case for machine learning is half the problem. And 
many people make wrong choices in that aspect and end up not seeing the benefits that they uh, expect and either give up or you know go through hardships in making that right. So uh, going back to the question, uh, let me say when not to use. I think that's as important, if not more, than when to use you know, AI ML uh, or what's the right use case, is anything that can be solved with traditional organism, uh, so algorithms, rather. Problem is not very complex, then you know, using ML may be overcomplicated. And also, if it does not require to uh, adapting to new data, right? Um, and if the data or condition, conditions are not changing, it becomes much more you know, predictable, right? So in those cases, you could look to a traditional you know, approach, uh, which may be more appropriate, right? Mm -hmm. And machine learning, contrary to the belief, may not be 100% accurate uh, in many cases, right? If you are expecting 100% accuracy, it may not be the right one you know, to use. And mm -hmm. last but not least is, uh, uh, anything that requires full interpretability, which is to being able to explain what's going to happen if you change certain parameters or if you, you know, uh, certain input is a priority, machine learning may not be the best solution. Except for that, you know, for everything else, I think you could use, you know, machine learning because I ruled out, you know, things where, where not to use. Being practical about it is, you know, finding the right problem, understanding the domain, uh, having the right data to, you know, train and validate the model. I think those are as, you know, essential. And those are some of the steps that you can take is looking at your business process, uh, where's the problem, identifying that, and then assessing if that's the right problem to go after by, you know, applying the, I wouldn't call them rules, some of the qualifiers, if you will, uh, and, and going after that would, would be the right approach, in my opinion. Yes. Okay. So let's um, sort of just tunnel down into the sort of whys and wherefores of all mm -hmm. that. So you've mm -hmm. said that people don't always recognize um, the necessity of having the right data for training mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the technology, and also that identifying the right use case can be half the problem. So why is that? Is it a case of before the training of the machine, it's the training of the person, the man or human, I should say, to be equitable in this day and age? <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the skills aspect of the humans, because if you, as I said, if you choose the wrong problem, then, you know, you would end up with the wrong result, which could lead to uh, either, you know, being discouraged uh, to not proceed further in using the, you know, the, the machine learning techniques and, you know, so on and so forth. So the right training uh, for the individual, whether it's a decision maker or, you know, whoever it is, uh, that's part of this process of charting the course for AI ML journey within an organization is absolutely required. Uh, and sometimes by just, you know, getting training, you may not be able to make the right decisions uh, either. So in those cases, even going to the extent of engaging external, you know, experts uh, or advisors uh, is also something that I would recommend is, you know, seed the team that's driving this innovative uh, technology uh, and, and usage within your organization with experts that have already done this before, and then use them and, and build teams around them to get your own teams learn the right way. That's, you know, that, that, that would be something that I would certainly recommend. Okay. So we've got the, the right teams with the right skill set. They've had the right advice. We've got the right data for training the machines. Mm -hmm. How then can AI be used to optimize healthcare operations? I think the, the best way to look at uh, optimizing healthcare uh, operations is that you're going to be, uh, you're going to have uh, humans making a lot of decisions. 
um, that is not going away because of the importance of these decisions that are being made. And many of them literally, you know, life or death kind of uh, decisions. Not all of them, but the impact on human life, uh, you can't ignore that when you are talking about healthcare operations. So uh, using AI to aid humans. The other thing is we also have collected a lot of data in, in, in healthcare and you know, life sciences over the course of uh, many, many years um, since we have uh, been either performing clinical research are providing care, you know, as simple as that, right? And also the volume of data is increasing exponentially and humans uh, are, are using human effort to crunch this data and, and you know, the increasing volume of data uh, is going to be challenging, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I feel AI could be used to uh, optimize uh, the, the the use of uh, human uh, effort, uh, knowledge, and in turn optimize the operations, be it in terms of providing better oversight for the operation, the end-to-end -end operations, and you know, identifying new treatments, uh, new drugs, mm -hmm. uh, or new devices for that matter, uh, and being able to optimize the operations end-to-end -end so that you are reducing the cycle time. Uh, and, and also in terms of predicting you know, risks and problems even before they occur, a classic case where you know, machine learning could potentially be used. Mm -hmm. uh, and also have enough staff uh, to monitor patients. And sometimes we struggle with that while the patient is uh, in the clinic or the ho hospital, and it's even more difficult when they are not in that healthcare setting. So even you know leveraging this to monitor patients remotely uh, and not having to bring them to a hospital, which is which could be a you know a difficult uh, journey and also mm -hmm. a costly affair, if you will. So many of these aspects uh, could be addressed by leveraging AI ML, which uh, I feel in turn would lead to optimization of the healthcare operations as you were uh, asking. Yes, I mean, a lot of information there that you've just sort of covered. So I just want to break it down slightly. So we've looked at um, that sort of critical human element or the human in the loop that has yes. to remain when it comes yes. to making decisions about human lives. Um, so we, we've covered that, but I just want to go further into um, AI or machine learning's role in A, IDing new drug targets, and B, also you mentioned uh, medical devices or sort of the digital aspect of stuff when mm -hmm. it comes to health maintenance. Perhaps mm -hmm. you could tell me more about that. So in the pharma value chain, end-to-end, uh, uh, R&D &end, plays an important part, and within R&D is the research and discovery aspects that happen upfront in identifying right disease to go after and the right molecule or you know whatever the case is right, right treatment let me put it that way right so there to for that um, disease and so on and so forth right so mm -hmm. that is a very data intensive uh, exercise right uh, for as they call it target you know identification and selection so that's where a lot of uh, in silico uh, drug discovery uh, ideas uh, and, and uh, methods are being uh, leveraged you know, across the industry. And there are uh, huge investments by large you know, pharma, biotechs, and med devices, uh, med device companies uh, happening in this uh, phase. So that, uh, and the need for high uh, performance uh, computing, you know, environments uh, as well, right? So, which is another, you know, area where leveraging machine learning in uh, spinning those environments off and leveraging um, the right data, uh, so on and so forth. So, net net, there's there are a lot of uh, applications of uh, AI and ML in identifying the right 
uh, products or uh, you know even diseases to go after, as as I mentioned earlier. Now coming to the uh, the devices uh, part, um, mm -hmm. I think more uh, not only from the discovery and development of these uh, devices, but the use of them, uh, whether it is within a healthcare setting where something is being leveraged to either diagnose uh, a condition or treat a patient, uh, many of these devices uh, are generating a lot of data points and digitally mm -hmm. uh, speaking, right? Whether it's uh, uh, images or you know ECG or EKG um, or uh, something trivial as your you know vital signs could be blood pressure you know blood glucose level whatever the case is right and being able to aggregate that data standardize that data to some extent and making that data available for decision making that in itself could uh, could be a daunting task uh, and an area where having machine learning models to aggregate that data, clean that data, making that data available with the right insights and in near real time, or if, if not real time in certain cases, so that you are able to make the right decisions. Uh, and we are already seeing practical uses of this where, uh, if not widespread, but at least, you know, things that we might have uh, uh, read or heard already is a doctor performing uh, a surgery, right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. takes a lot of um, number crunching, image, you know, processing uh, and uh, uh, presentation of all of these together from a decision making standpoint and then driving the devices that are actually performing the surgery by a, a doctor or a surgeon that's remote. That's a perfect example where some of these machine learning models could come to fruition uh, in a practical manner. Mm, definitely. Okay, so I was gonna go on to my next question, which was a question of infrastructure, whether the mm -hmm. infrastructure is already in place for successful implementation of AI and machine learning. I mean, is there further modernization that's needed? You've just been giving a very sort of real world setting of surgery, remote mm -hmm. surgery using it, but is there more that needs to be done for successful, yeah. like fully successful implementation? Yeah, so I, I think it depends on the organization uh, and, and their maturity uh, in adopting some of the modern technologies that would be required uh, to adopt uh, machine learning. Is an organization fully adopting cloud, for example, right? Uh, or are they still relying on legacy ways of working with their own you know, data centers or on-premise you know, kind of solutions? And as I was explaining earlier, machine learning also requires a lot of compute uh, capability. Mm -hmm. Do you have that available? Do you have the right plan? And do you, do, do you have the right processes set up to be able to provision the kind of capability that you would require to, uh, to, to adopt AI and machine learning? The other aspect is data, which is a huge part of uh, machine learning is do you have access to the right data? Where is that data setting? Is that you know something that you have full access to or is that being sourced externally? If it's being sourced ex externally, where should you have that data and, and how do you make that available for training of the models uh, and also uh, validation, uh, performing that exploratory data analysis upfront by data engineers to make sure that the data is, uh, is, is available and is the right data. Because many a times if the training data is not uh, right and if it has any kind of bias, and that's another you know, big challenge uh, for the industry is how to build AI and machine learning models without um, bias, right? So that's where the right data also plays a big part. Uh, last but not least is machine learning models. What models do you want to use? Do you have those developed in-house or are you going to source them 
from outside. Uh, if you are sourcing them from outside, what would be the right you know, validation model? And adapting to the shift in data, because you might be uh, training your model for uh, data, for, for with the data that exists today, but over a period of time, that data could, you know, could shift, you know, as time progresses, how do you adopt to that? So going back to the original question of what infrastructure uh, is required for a successful implementation uh, and, and what's needed from a modernization standpoint, all of these elements need to be uh, looked at and prepped and adopted uh, and planned for by the organizations to be able to successfully uh, implement uh, AI and machine learning within their uh, uh, environments or organizations. Okay, and I just want to focus on the organizations. You said it's organization dependent, and you earlier mentioned uh, large pharma, biotechs, med device companies. Is there, well, there must be. I mean, what is the uh, differentiation between the adoption between such uh, differing companies? So, um, taking up uh, AI and machine learning is uh, usually a uh, uh, a huge commitment, uh, if you will. Uh, yes, you can do the one-off, you know, pilot or uh, proof of concept, uh, but unless until uh, you are serious and are committed to making uh, the investment that would be required to adopt uh, in, in a larger scale, it would be difficult for you to, you know, to, to reap the benefits uh, that you uh, expect from AI and machine learning. So. What we, uh, at least I'm seeing, uh, based on the knowledge uh, and working with the industry, is where it's a lot easier to uh, set up uh, an operation or an innovation uh, team that could focus on AI ML uh, in a larger organization as opposed to some of the you know, mid-sized to emerging you know, pharma. Mm -hmm. um, and the culture, the, the organizational culture of whether uh, they are an organization that encourages entrepreneurship, which also, which is another aspect that is required within the organization to drive initiatives like this, and innovation, uh, and, and organizations that are better prepared to handle change uh, as well, because this is going to be a very uh, disruptive. Uh, change uh, that organizations, you know, have to deal with. So I feel larger pharma, biotech, and med devices companies are a lot more capable and conducive to start this journey. But within that segment, organizations that are a lot more innovative or that have the culture of, you know, innovation and, and transformation are um, a uh, lot better equipped to start uh, the journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the commitment, uh, not just at an individual department or a team level, but as an organization from the top is also very, very important uh, because you will fail in some situations or many situations, but should have uh, and, uh, that commitment and uh, the ability to uh, look past uh, these initial you know, failures before you are successful and are adopting uh, AI and machine learning approaches uh, as part and parcel of your day-to-day -day business operations. So at least that's my take on you know, how possibly large organizations are suited. That, that is not to say that you know, mid-market and you know, emerging companies could not adopt it, but one advantage some of the emerging and mid-market uh, companies do have is the, the nimbleness uh, and the agility in terms of decision-making and support that, be, that makes it that much uh, easier for those organizations around this because large organizations could be marred with uh, bureaucracy and uh, roadblocks in making some of these decisions. So at least that's my take, uh, Nicole. No, no, no. That very valid points, Vino. Um, I'm just thinking about it. I'm thinking about these keywords, innovation, commitment, transformation, and the sort of buzz expression, if you will, of this year, disruptive change. Mm -hmm. So with this in mind, mm -hmm. 
and its uh, ongoing applicability, its increased bleeding into pharma and healthcare settings, for want of a better expression. What mm-hmm. is your prediction for the next decade, the next two decades? What will be the place of AI and machine learning technologies within those settings, given that concept of disruptive change? And also what you mentioned earlier, the place of AI and machine learning for um, overcoming access and equitability issues. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, I have to wear my you know, my, my hat of uh, being the the oracle to, to break the future for this <laughs> one, I guess. Question. I question. <laughs> we won't yeah. hold you to the answer, don't worry. But just <laughs> thinking now, yeah. what would you say? So um, see, one thing that um, many people don't realize is the fact that Healthcare and life sciences is very conservative and very conservative in terms of uh, adopting, you know, innovation. And rightfully so, because we deal with, you know, human lives, uh, right? And and any aggressive or uh, adoption of technology or anything for that matter, any steps that you would take that would come in the way of or, or harm uh, people's uh, lives is going to be a no-no, right? And and that's the case from uh, the healthcare and life sciences organizations, from the regulators, uh, and definitely from a patient standpoint, right? So it takes a lot of time for innovations to fully take roots uh, and, and flourish uh, within our uh, sector. And in some cases, as I've lived through some of this uh, almost 15 to 20 years, things like you know, electronic uh, data capture. And we are still uh, trying to figure out how best to leverage, you know, decentralized clinical trials, sensors, wearables, and, you know, so on and so forth. So with that, you know, background uh, and uh, situation, what I would say is this is the exploratory phase, and I think this is going to continue for another, you know, three to five years where organizations are trying to figure out what are the right ideas to go after? What is the right process? Uh, what's the right infrastructure uh, that we need? Uh, and uh, find some, you know, small to moderate, you know, success, which uh, will then aid the next set of uh, adoption, I, I, I feel. And then after that, uh, another uh, thing that's going to happen, uh, in my opinion, is the acceptance of uh, machine learning as a mainstream uh, uh, application in the process uh, within the healthcare and life sciences uh, setting, that's going to happen more and more. Uh, there is guidance put out by FDA and you know and and others already in some way, shape, or form. But mm-hmm. that acceptance as a mainstream apl- application of machine learning is going to happen over the next you know five to ten years, where it it will become a common you know, a uh, tool, uh, that's what I call machine learning is like uh, in, in the armory of many tools available to discover uh, new drugs uh, and, and help patients is one of the tools that uh, we could use uh, in that process. And beyond that, over the next 10 to 20 years, I, I feel that a handful of major drugs would go through uh, the process of being discovered using AI ML and also using AI ML through their development uh, process and being, you know, uh, put out into the market for use by patients and AI and ML being leveraged to monitor the progress of uh, patients by utilizing these drugs. I would you know, put that anywhere in the magnitude of maybe 10 to 20 drugs that are, you know, fully driven by AI and uh, ML over the next, you know, 10 to 20 years. Mm, Fascinating. Okay, Vinu, thank you very much for your time. It has been a really interesting conversation and it's been lovely chatting with you. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate the opportunity. So that concludes another episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. You can find out more information about this episode, including a download link, 
and information about previous installments of the series at farmerforum.com forward slash podcasts. The Farmer Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher and Podbean, where you can find and subscribe by searching for Farmer Forum. Of course, don't forget to visit our website itself, where you can sign up for daily news and analysis bulletins, and follow us on Twitter, or X nowadays, at at PharmaForum. That's all for now. Thank you for listening.